In this video, I want to talk about Coulomb's Law. I'll give a bit of background information about the law and explain what it is and the basics of where it comes from, and then we'll go through a simple example problem about it. So let's begin. Let's first go through a quick recap of what electric charge is and how it works. All objects are made of tiny little things called atoms, which I'm making look a little bigger here, and all atoms are made up of protons neutrons, and electrons. I won't go into too much detail about the anatomy of the atom itself right now, because that's something that's better suited for a series on chemistry. But the important thing for now is how these particles affect an object's charge. Neutrons can be ignored, since they don't have any charge. But protons have a positive charge, and electrons have a negative one. If an object has more protons than electrons, then its net charge is positive. If an object has more electrons than protons, then its net charge is negative. Most objects have roughly the same number of electrons and protons, so their charges cancel out, and the net charge is zero. We can say that those objects are neutrally charged, which is why this middle one is called a neutron. The key thing to understand here is that positively charged particles and negatively charged particles will experience an attractive force towards each other, kind of like gravity, and how gravity causes objects with mass to experience an attractive force to one another. However, positive charges and other positive charges will actually experience a repulsive force, and they'll be pushed away from one another. And the same goes for negative charges. If you have a negative charge and another negative charge, they will be repelled from one another by some invisible force. So a common way of summarizing this is to say that opposite charges attract while like charges repel. The force, whether it's attractive or repulsive, can be described using Coulomb's Law. Normally when I introduce formulas, I first derive the equation or prove that it's true. But since the formula that I'm about to write down was demonstrated experimentally, the only justification for it that I can give is that experiments have shown it to be true. That's why it's called a law, because it's an observation on, of nature that we've found. So let's say that we have two electrically charged particles, and these two particles are at some distance apart that I will label as R. Since the letter Q is commonly used for electric charge as the symbol for it, let's say that one particle has a charge of Q sub 1, and the other particle has a charge of Q2. Now experiments have shown that the electrostatic force experienced between these two particles, or F, is equal to some proportionality constant, K, times the product of these two charges, Q1 times Q2, divided by the square of R. This relationship was found in the late 1700s, though the value of this K constant was determined experimentally later. So for a while, this formula was only known as a proportionality. This equation is known as Coulomb's Law, and the electric charges themselves are quantified using the unit Coulombs. So one charged particle, for example, can be said to have a charge of three coulombs, where a capital C is used as the symbol for the unit, coulomb. The K is called Coulomb's constant, and it has a value of approximately 8.99 times 10 to the ninth power, with units of newton meter squared per coulomb squared. You might sometimes see the K be written as one over 4 times pi times epsilon naught. This is partly for historical reasons, but also partly because this form simplifies equations that we'll see when we get into later topics, like electric fields and Gauss's law. But those are for later videos. The epsilon naught symbol has some funky names like the vacuum permittivity or the electric constant, and it has a value of about 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, with units of coulomb squared over newton meter squared. 
One final thing I want to note about Coulomb's Law is people can get confused by the fact that charge can be either positive or negative. Since the two charges are multiplied by each other in the numerator of the equation, that means that, by convention, if two charges of the same sign are involved, this formula, this force, is always positive. But it's always negative if two charges of opposite signs are involved. The physical significance of this convention is kind of debatable, since negative signs when dealing with vectors like forces are really only useful when we have a specifically defined coordinate system that goes along with them, which can be a little annoying to deal with sometimes. So to make things much simpler, you'll probably most commonly, or at least somewhat commonly, see the formula written like this where the F and the charges have the absolute value lines around them, in which case we're only looking at the magnitudes of all these values. This version of the equation is sometimes more useful when doing really complicated problems, since the negative signs will no longer get in the way of whatever coordinate system you define. Plus, if we're looking at a system of three or more charged particles, or even cases where the particles aren't all along a single axis, the negative sign that comes along with it kind of becomes, usually becomes completely useless anyways. Most of the time we use Coulomb's Law in problems, we're most interested in the magnitude of the force, and then we can take care of the rest of the vectory directional stuff by defining our own coordinate system for the problem and going from there. So just to show the law in action, let's go over a basic example problem. Here's a pretty basic example problem where we're dealing with two problems. One of them has a charge of 2.00 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, and the second one has a charge of 3.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And yes, charges usually are this small. And we know that the two charges are about 14 centimeters away from one another, so they have this distance apart. Uh, r, where r is equal to 14.0 centimeters, which can also be written as 0 0.140 meters. Converting to meters will, of course, as usual, make things easy on us when we get to our final calculation. So the problem asks for the magnitude of the electrostatic force, so that means, that's a, that's a good sign, that it's time to bust out Coulomb's Law. So of course the formula tells us that the force, the electrostatic force, is equal to the product of the charges, and times k, that's in there too, divided by the square of the distance. We are, of course, given the charges here, and k is a constant, so it always has the exact same value. It's always equal to 8.99, this is just approximation. If you want to go on the internet, you can look up like the a, a much more precise version of this value, and it's much longer with many more significant figures. But usually the approximation of 8.99 is good enough. And it's 8.99 times 10 to the power of 9 newton meters squared per coulomb squared. And so we plug the charges we're given in for Q as long, and this constant in for K. And then we put in 0 0.140 for meters. And if we do all that into our calculator, then we should find an electrostatic force of about 2.75 newtons. So that is our answer to this very basic example problem where we just put those values directly into Coulomb's Law. So you just want to remember that if you have two electrically charged particles that are some distance from each other and we're looking at electrostatics where the charges aren't moving, then we can find the force between them using this formula. So that was a pretty basic example but I plan to make more videos on more complex examples that can really test you. For now, I hope this video has helped you to get a grasp of how Coulomb's Law fundamentally works, and if there are any other nuances you'd like me to talk about in later videos, please leave a comment below and I'll do my best to help you out. Have a good night.